to wrap up to wrap up this first chapter on reproducible research, I want to talk just a little bit more about a few extras that you might want to do with Knitter. So things like like tables and including outside graphics or figures, and then also um, including mathematical equations. So let's start with this idea of including mathematical equations in Knitter. Actually, uh, one of the things that made LaTeX, which Knitter is a little bit built on, what made that so powerful was that it allowed for really nice typesetting of math. You can include equations in R Markdown documents, and you'll be using LaTeX syntax for that. So I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But to set them off, if you want an equation all by itself, you do what's called a display equation, and you do two dollar signs before and after and kind of surround those by blank lines. So let's take a look. If you remember, we have this, this document that I was just working on a bit, but we could actually take out some of this code. And uh, let's do here. Example equation for this section. So I'll say here is an example equation. And then when we're ready to put that math in, we'll put two dollar signs to start it and then two dollar signs to stop it. And then in between is where we'll put the syntax for that math. So there's some things that are pretty straightforward, like if you want to just put the expected value of y, you could just put that in the normal letters, and you can see down here it's showing that. But then there are also special characters you can use to create different formats. So for example, to use an underscore, you'll do the little kind of underline symbol, and you can see that that has put in an underscore here. If we wanted to use the kind of squiggly line that you see a lot in statistics, you can use sim for that. That gives kind of a tilde there. And then maybe we want to do this with some Greek letters. So maybe we're thinking that that can be expressed by alpha plus maybe beta x uh, t. So this lets you build it up. So the only trick here, of course, is you need to know what all these little codes are. So for that, you can go to a LaTeX um, cheat sheet. So I, I've put in a link here. This goes through and it gives you tips on what all of those are. So like down here, you can see for those Greek letters for alpha and beta, here are the things that you need to put in for that. Um, for division, for less than, greater than, all of the symbols here, it takes you through. And this will get you through a lot of what you might need as you're writing math um, using these equations. The other thing you can do if you'd like is you could do something like code cogs. So this actually lets you kind of type out your equation using these, these point and click buttons, but then it types out the LaTeX for you and you can copy that in. So let's say that we wanted to use this, um, this summation. A lot of times we might want to use that, right? And maybe we want to have like kind of an underscore and an overscore. And you can see as I'm doing this, it's building it down here. So it already did that part. And maybe we want to say like i equals one and then going up to n and then I don't know, like um, two. And then we're going to do a superscript for that to the, to the I. So you can see that it's built it down here. Then if you want to bring that in to, um, to your R Markdown document, you can come in and just paste it in here. And you can see that it's done the same thing there. So just as a note for this, this works very well when you're rendering to PDF. It might not always work quite as well when you're rendering to other formats. So this really is using that LaTeX type syntax for building the equations. I think that the, the, the engine that's rendering to HTML and the browser extensions that kind of like allow for rendering this different stuff, I think those have all improved in recent years. So I think you can do a lot more of this math in HTML than you maybe could in the past. But I would still double check if I were you if you're trying to do this to any output that is not PDF. So here's an example. Again, you're welcome to play around with that in your own R Markdown. And again, the only trick is just figuring out what different symbols you need to put in for these different parts. You can also do an inline equation. You might want to talk about something as you're kind of writing this up. So you might want to say here, um, we have data for maybe that YT. Oh. When you're doing it in with your other writing, you set that apart with single dollar signs on each side. Now when we run it, we'll see that in the R Markdown document, it has included these equations. Right now I'm rendering to PDF too, so um, I've got a little bit more assurance it's going to come through correctly. But you can see it's done these equations set apart where we did the double dollar signs, 
uh, and put the, the equation in the middle. And then here where we did the single one, it's putting it right in line with the other text, but it's got it in kind of like a slightly italicized font where it sets it off a little bit to show it's something different. The next thing that you can do is you can include figures. And this isn't just figures that you create in R where we've already looked at how you can put stuff in the code chunk. You can also put in a figure that you have somewhere separately. So let's see if we can do an example for that. Um, our mascot here at CSU is the CSU RAM. So let's look for CSU RAM uh, dot PNG maybe. All right, that looks good. So we can go and um, and get a copy of that to use as an example. So let's save the image as, and I will put it in my R practice. I'll, we'll do a new one called um, graphics maybe. So then we can come through and save that and we'll save it as just CSU RAM. All right, so if we look here, we now have this graphics folder and we have CSU RAM.png. If we want to put that somewhere in here, we can do a new section where we do example graphics. And now inside a code chunk, we can use this function from Knitter. So we'll need to make sure that we have Knitter loaded. And then the function is called include underscore graphics. And then you'll do the, the file path to your graphic, just like you would do the file path to a file with data if you were reading in some new data. So in this case, again, our R markdown is saved in the, in the practice R uh, directory if you're following along and doing it the same way I'm doing it. And then within that, we, are, we have this figure in that graphics subdirectory. So we'll need to do graphics first, and then at this point we can tab complete, and that's the only file in there. So now when we run it and should include that, and then you can do some things like adjust the, the out width for that. So we can come down and see that it included that by us doing that code. Again, just as a reminder, you need to give the file path from the directory where your R markdown file is saved because that is used as the working directory when your R markdown is rendered. So that was using a graphic file you've already had. It can be helpful sometimes outside of R Markdown just to know how to save the figures that you create with R. So we're gonna step out of the R Markdown piece just for a minute and talk about how you can save your own figures that you create to different file formats. So let's do an example here, and we've been working a lot with that Faraway package. And then with the World Cup data set. So we can get that loaded, and then let's also make sure that we have um, all of the Tidyverse stuff running. All right, so now we can do World Cup, and we can pipe it into ggplot and do that x equals the time and then y equals the shots. This is, again, that World Cup data. So we're going to do a scatter plot of time versus the shots. And for a scatter plot, that's got points, so we do gm point. All right, so we've got our plot over here. So there are a few things we could do at this stage. You can do export, and you can save this either as an image or a PDF. So we can look at that. The default will be our plot, but we could do World Cup example. And if you want, you can view the plot after you save it just to see what it looks like. Right now, it's going to put it in this directory where we're working. So if we save that, it's opened it up so I can look at it. And you can see the dimensions are a little bit off, but you can tweak that too if you want. Then if you look in our files, you can see that we now have this World Cup example. So that's the file that we just saved. So that's one way to do it, but it does involve some of this point and click. Like it's not reproducible in the sense that there's something in your script that is writing out that file to a certain location. So let's delete that file, and then we can look at some other ways to do it. So in R, you can open up a graphics device using a number of different calls, and the name of the call depends on the type of device you want to open, so PDF or PNG or so on. Then you run the code that writes out the plots, that creates the plot, and then you close the device. That's the classic way to do this. We'll talk in just a second about an alternative that's a little bit more modern, but I do think this is a really good system to know. So for example, you would open a graphics device like a PDF device by using PDF in this case, and then you put the name that you want to save this file to. 
So then as I mentioned, you'll print the code and then we'll close the device. So let's take a look at doing that. If we wanted to save this, we could do it, like this is the code that really prints out that object. So we need to surround that with PDF to open the device and dev off to close the device the device, excuse me, this PDF part, if we wanted to write out to a JPEG or a PNG or another file format, that part would change. And I'll list some of the different functions we have for that in just a minute. The dev off is always the same. This is closing that graphics device. All right, so we can put maybe World Cup example.pdf. This is just the name of the file that we want to write to when we've got that device open. All right, so now we'll run this and we can see we've already got our file down here. It's already creating it. It's not going to have stuff that we can see in it yet. It won't like finish until we close it, but it's already opened it up. Then when we run this, it won't print out to our plots page. Instead, it's printing out to that device that we opened. And then we can do dev off and that'll close it. And we can open that and we can see the figure that we've created there. There are different options for these different devices. Like if we look at the help file for PDF, you can see it has some different things like width and height. So you can specify the dimensions that you want in terms of how tall and how, how long. So we could do that here. And I think the default units for that are inches. So we could try doing something that's maybe like um, five inches by, I don't know, four. So let's take a look at that. All right, we can go through and open up our new version. And now you can see it's a little bit longer than it is tall. So maybe that's, that's a dimension that we want. So here's the example of doing that. We were just trying that out with a slightly simpler example. But again, the key parts are that we're opening the device with PDF and then we're closing it with DevOff. You can create more than one plot and it'll actually have them on different files. So we could try that too. So here we have the code that creates the first scatter plot, and maybe we want one where we look based on passes as well. So now if we run all of this, it's going to overwrite the previous file that we had. And when we open it up, you can see that we now have two pages. The first one shows the first plot, and the second one shows the second plot that we ask it for. So I mentioned that there are a number of different devices that you can open in terms of the graphic device where you write and create the file. And it's going to depend on what file type you want. So if you want a PDF file, you use PDF just like I was showing. If you want a PNG, you use PNG and so on. So there are a number of different ones for that. Regardless of which one you use to open up your device, though, you always use dev.off to close it. It doesn't matter which one you open with, you always use that same one to close the device. All right, so we just looked at an example of this, but we have these different options we can use for those, including height and width, to work with the dimensions of the, the output that you create. The more modern option for all of these is the ggsave function. So what we were just looking at was in base R. ggsave, um, it will help you particularly with ggplot objects, but I think you might be able to do it with other figure output as well. That will allow you to write out to any of these devices instead of having a different function for each device. In this case, there is a parameter in the ggsave function that lets you specify which device you want to use. You will see people using both of these, both ggsave and um, those different device operators than with devoff when they are creating uh, files that have figures in them, that have these images in them. Um, I think I'm seeing more of a shift now to ggsave, and I'm starting to do that a little bit more myself, but you certainly see a lot of cases where people are still specifying it based on the type of, of graphics driver they want to open. The last little thing that I wanted to talk about is tables. So you can include tables as well. Um, I've shown an example here where I've created a data frame. Here I'm just using data.frame. Of course, you could use tibble for this. Sometimes the triple function is really nice, T-R-I-B-B-L-E. That is in the, the tibble package as well. And instead of building up a data frame by doing um, kind of one column at a time, it lets you do it by row. So sometimes it's just a little bit easier to see as you're setting up. But once you have a data frame, you can print it out as a table using this cable call. And that's something that comes in Knitter. So let's take a look at that. And we could actually include a table based on some of our data. Um, so let's see, we have the World Cup data loaded. Maybe not, maybe we should put it back. So I'll do Fairway and then Data World Cup. Oops. 
And then maybe we want to do World Cup and do slice the first three. And maybe let's select just team and position and time. Okay, so I'm creating that as an object. If we just put in, if we just directly print that out, then what will happen is it'll look like code like this. So let's take a look at that in our R Markdown document. Nope got to loot some other packages. We'll do um we will do the the tidyverse to get all of the all of the different functions. Excuse me, all of the tidyverse packages. Alright, so when we run through with this, you can see that we just get the output here. And maybe let me show it. I, I have it running to PDF right now, but I can go back to HTML. Let's take a look at that in HTML. Alright, so down here we have our output and it just looks like code, right? So we might want that to look like a prettier uh, table. And you can do that by using the cable function. This is from Knitter, so let's make sure that we load Knitter. Now all that you'll do is wrap this in the cable call. Now we can take a look at before we run it right here in our code at what this does. So if we, let's make sure we have that loaded, if we come down and, and do this, then you can see it prints it out just like that in the R markdown itself, this kind of rendered version. If we do it at the console, it's actually showing us the markdown version of that. So this is using syntax that exists in Markdown to designate a table. So it's kind of taking that and translating it into the Markdown syntax you need for a table. Now when we run this, we'll see that that's put together as a nicer looking table. Right down here, you can see that this looks more like a real table. There are some options you can put in. There's a call names option for cable that you can use to change the column names from their default. So again, their default is whatever you've been working with in that data frame in R. You might want to make them nicer for humans to read. You can also change the alignment. Um, L will stand for left in the column, C is centered, and R is to the right. You can add a caption if you want, and if you have digits, you can round those. So if you have something that's very long, you can round to a few significant digits. This is an example of doing that. So here I've created a small data frame and I'm using this R norm function just to get some random numbers from a normal distribution. Um, so when we print that out, we can do digits equals two and you can see it's rounded all of these to just have two digits. With this align, I've said that I want the first column to be right aligned. So you can see these are all the way over to the right hand side of that column. And then the next one to be centered. So these are right in the middle of their column. With caption, I've added this caption up at the top, and then with call names, I took the original column names, which were letters and numbers, and made them something nicer. The first one is first three letters, and the next one's first three numbers. So for a lot of these, like call names and a line, you just put things in in the order that the columns come in. So this is the value for the first column and the value for the second, and so on for this one. So that's about all you can do with Cable. It's actually kind of nice, like a UAG who created Knitter and created Cable, he decided very explicitly that he wanted to keep this very simple and not try to reinvent the wheel. So he actually has this quote, want more features? No, that's it. I don't want to reinvent the wheel. Instead, if you do want to start doing more complex things, there are some other packages that let you do that. And some of them let you get very kind of complex and fancy tables that are really quite wonderful. So those include Xtable Panther and uh, Cable Extra, which is one of my all time favorites right now. Now, the trick with those is that as you get into these more complex things, uh, you might need to do different specifications depending on whether you're going to HTML or whether you're going to PDF or whether you're going to Word. So far we've been a little bit spoiled in the sense that everything we wanted to do we could express it the same way whether we wanted the output to be HTML 
or Word or PDF. But as you get into these more complex and very specific things, they won't work across all the formats anymore. It'll really get specific to one particular output format. So it gives you a lot of power, but it does also kind of reduce the, the breadth that you can work with things as you get into those complex, fancier things with a Markdown.